<laughs> Crystal, what are you taking a look at? Well, if you live in America, it will be no surprise to you that we are reckoning with a legitimate nationwide housing crisis. Since the 1990s, housing prices have skyrocketed, far outpacing that of overall inflation, making home ownership more and more out of reach for young Americans, unless, of course, mom and dad can foot the bill. But it's not just home prices, it's also rents, which have gone up insane amounts, pushing the working class to the edge and the poor over the brink. Today, according to the Census Bureau, the median renter spends 30% of their income on shelter. That means that your typical renter in America is now cost burden, meaning that they are spending what's considered to be an unsustainable percentage of their income on rent, leaving very little for everything else. Just take a look at this map. So the darker the blue here, the more cost burdened the renters are. You can see the whole map is pretty much awash in blue and some locales are in truly dire shape. In New York City, the rent to income ratio is 68.5%. In Miami, it's 41.6%. How are you gonna eat and drive and live when your whole paycheck is going to pay your rent? Since the 70s, rents have gone up faster than wages and that trend shows no sign of slowing down. Well, what if I told you there are places that have actually solved this problem, that have had the political will and imagination to escape our brutal urban housing hellscape? Turns out the solution is really kind of simple. If your citizens need more quality, affordable housing, then you should build it. This is the lesson drawn from an in-depth profile by the New York Times of the city of Vienna's approach to housing. Here's that piece. You can take a look. It's titled, Imagine a Renter's Utopia. It might look like Vienna. Prior to World War I, Vienna suffered with horrible housing conditions. Renters would sublet their beds out to day and night workers to try to couple to cobble together enough money to make the rent. Conditions were absolutely atrocious. But in the 20s, during a time known as Red Vienna, when socialists led the city council, Vienna embarked on a grand program of public housing construction. Now, these new apartments were modest by present standards, but they did include basic luxuries, things like indoor plumbing and private bathrooms. And while socialists don't run the joint anymore, the city has maintained its commitment to high-quality social housing that is available for poor, working-class, and middle-class Viennese alike. Far from the rundown image of American housing projects, these apartments actually look really nice. Modern construction, beautiful amenities like rooftop pools, idyllic courtyards, interiors bathed in natural light, balconies with lush greenery. They're available to most city residents and plenty actually avail themselves of this option. The median income in Vienna is 57,000 euros roughly, and anyone making less than 70,000 euros can actually qualify for one of these apartments. And once you're in, they can't kick you out, even if your income goes up and is above that limit. About two thirds of the rental market in Vienna is actually rent controlled, and about three fifths of city residents live in social housing. This huge investment in affordable housing has brought down costs for everyone, whether they live in social housing, rent in the private market, or actually own their own place. The Times profiled a couple who have lived in social housing for decades and so have benefited over years from regulation setting the maximum pace at which rent can increase. In reversal from U.S. trends, this couple has had their wages far outpace rent growth over the course of their adult lives. Today, their rent is only 270 euros per month. That makes up less than 4% of their total pre-tax incomes. <laughs> These aren't wealthy people either. One's a teacher, the other's a city accountant. Yet rent is as insignificant a cost to them as meals out are to the average American. Can you imagine what trips you might take, investments you might make, interest you might indulge if your shelter cost only 4% of your pre-tax income? Matt Brunick's People's Policy Project has done a lot of research on what exactly this could look like in an American context. They point not only to Vienna, but also Sweden and Finland as models to follow and advocate for a build out of 10 million new units in 10 years. Now, these units would be owned by the government, available to all, and rent would be based on a sliding income scale. Having multiple classes in one building is really key for avoiding the segregation and decay that characterizes our existing public housing stock. Now, now might be a particularly auspicious time to act. Housing affordability, as you all know, is at an all-time low, but also the abandonment of downtowns by office workers means that there's a lot of vacant space, which will be vacant in the coming years, and those buildings will be turned over. Government could snatch up these locations at fire sale prices to convert into social housing, thereby solving the problems of housing affordability and vacant downtowns in one fell swoop. I am well aware of how fanciful this all sounds. It blows my mind that we ever had the ambition to build out any public housing in an attempt to create quality, affordable housing for everyone. The optimism and confidence of such a project, it seems so far-fetched now. This isn't an accident. 
The whole job of modern Democratic and Republican politicians is to destroy our political imagination, to convince us that nothing is possible, our problems are intractable, incremental reform is the very best we can hope for. After all, if our political imaginations were not destroyed, we would certainly imagine a better politics for ourselves than these sorry losers and their raft of excuses and failures. We are living now in the wreckage of the neoliberal era, and one thing has become really clear. Just hoping that markets are gonna solve our problems has not and will not work. Developers and other corporations are not interested in solving social problems, they're interested in making money. That's fine, but somebody's gotta solve the social problems. That means we're going to have to rebuild the muscles of governance, atrophied by neoliberalism. We're gonna have to allow ourselves a little bit of political imagination, even if cynicism feels a lot safer, and actually expect our political system to make our lives better. And it's kind of mind blowing for an American context when you- Hey guys, ready or not, 2024 is fully upon us now. And Sagar and I have been brainstorming ways that we can really up our game for this critical election. Yeah, we rely on our premium subs to expand our coverage, to add staff, to upgrade the studio. We just want to give you the best independent coverage of this election, which is possible. So if you can help us out, become a premium subscriber today, breakingpoints.com, or the link is down here in the description video. It really means the world to us. And if you like what we're all about, this is the best possible way to keep us 100% independent, working only for you.